All right, there we go. Good day, everybody. Um, how are we doing? Happy to be in a new week. All right. So let's start off with a word of prayer. I hope we're doing very well. Um, oh yeah, let's start off with a word of prayer as we proceed in today's Bible study. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you because always and in in several um in several ways and in several in, in several occasions, you have shown us your love, you have expressed your kindness towards us, and we say thank you. We pray that as we go into your word, that you speak to our hearts, O oh Lord. I ask for eyes that see and ears that hear. I also pray, Father, that you grant me utterance to speak forth your word with power, with sim simplicity, and accuracy in the name of Jesus Christ. Let the hearts of um, everyone listening on this call and those that will listen later, let their hearts be prepared for the great and mighty things you have for them in the name of Jesus Christ. Use these uh, teachings, O oh Lord, to bring us into maturity. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Okay, amen, amen. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Um, we are continuing the same, you know, line of thoughts we've been We've been on for some weeks now, which is the whole concept of maturity uh, before God. And I've said time and again, and I'm going to repeat it, that God does <clears throat> want us to mature. Uh, he wants us to grow as believers. <clears throat> Excuse me. He wants us to mature and grow as believers, right? The same way um, as humans, we want our children to grow. We want them to come into a place of maturity and responsibility and that's the same thing too with god he wants us to get to a point where we are not we are no longer the responsibility of the kingdom but we are now responsible for the kingdom all right which is a way to differentiate between um baby believers and mature believers and that baby believers are the responsibility of the kingdom so everything the the relationship in that um in that on that level is always on the receiving side so children always just receive 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 but as you grow even in the natural as you grow up into adulthood you begin to give all right you begin to give to people around you, you begin to give to your parents you begin to give to um society at large okay and that's one of the proofs of maturity and the same thing too that god wants us to experience that we're no longer just on the receiving end of things but now we've grown in him that we are now giving and contributing to his kingdom all right so children are the responsibility of the of the kingdom but sons mature believers are responsible for the kingdom and god wants us to grow and so we'll be looking at this whole concept um for the past few weeks and we last week in particular, we we saw something interesting that God hides in darkness. God God made darkness a secret place. That's what um, um the psalm says in Psalm eighteen, verse six. He says he makes darkness um, his secret place, meaning that when you go through uh, dark seasons or when you go through experiences that are unpleasant by our estimation. It is where God is hidden, okay? And it's in that darkness that God hides himself. But most times people curse the darkness. People are angry, you know, with the darkness and they're asking, why me? Why am I going through all of this? But that is where God is is, is hidden, you know? Yesterday I was with a, we were, my wife and I went to visit a, a, a couple, you know, older couple. And we are just talking, we have talking about different things. And I just recall um, my experience back in university where, I was just going through a lot of financial pressure, all right? Um, school fees had not been paid. Pocket money was in there. And right, I was seeing, right in my front, you know, I was seeing my other colleague, my other, you know, classmates and schoolmates sort of just enjoying life. And everybody resuming when they should resume, eating be great and everything. And at, at some point, you know, I was walking back from my department one day and I asked God, God, why? Because I said to God, I'm not, I, I let's I agree that I'm not the holiest, but I know people that on this campus I am I am holier than or at least I'm better than. So why is it me that is going through these um experiences? And of course, God never answered, at least not in the way I thought he would answer. But the point is this that in those moments where I felt alone, where I felt I just didn't know what was going on, it was in those moments that I really experienced God and I 
came to understand God. And that served as a foundation for even my life currently. It was through those experiences that I was able to build faith, build tenacity. I was able to understand the rhythms of God and, and how to descend things in the spirit. It was through those experiences. It was in those experiences that I, since I didn't have, you know, some of the luxuries, I spent my time just praying and reading and, and studying, and that has helped me grow. So what I'm saying is that the darkness is where God is hidden. So if you are in a period of darkness or, or you will be at any point, just never forget this, that God is hidden in the darkness, all right? And we ended up by saying that in the wilderness season or in the darkness, God is preparing you for what he has prepared for you. And that is how God matures you. That there's already great destinies and, and um, promises that God has for us. There's like mighty things that God already has designed for us to experience. But I'm saying to you that while God has prepared something for you, God has to prepare you for what he has prepared for you. If not, if you enter into an experience that you are not prepared for, you would self-destruct. And God doesn't want to lose you. God would rather that you are alive and you are sane and you are in him than you entering into an experience that you are not prepared for because you would self-destruct, okay? So God prepares us and God doesn't prepare us in, in the public. God doesn't prepare us in presence of the whole world. He prepares us in the secret place, okay, in, in that darkness. And I used the analogy last week of um, of photography, how um, the camera has evolved now. We have, I mean, most of our cameras now are digital cameras, but back when, um, before the whole digital era, when photographers took pictures, they took pictures and it was saved on, on a film. And it's so interesting the way, the word that was used to, to, to um, reference that that film, what, what the photographers would call it is the negative. So the negative was saved, saved on the film. And then they take that negative into a dark room and they process it and an actual picture comes out. If you take that film with the negative on it, it wouldn't make sense to you. You wouldn't appreciate it. There are no colors and, you know, all the beauty in the picture that was captured. It's not there. But when you take that film into a dark room and you wash it, okay, what comes out is a picture that now has all the colors the um the everything that was captured and you know the beauty of of the entire scenery that's the same thing with with life okay that what is captured on that film right is it, the photographers call it the negative but that's also very instructive with our lives that it may seem like a negative experience but it's captured on that film and if you just take that experience in isolation it doesn't make sense you keep asking questions like i did why me lord why why is this happening to me but if you take that experience into the secret place and you process it, what will come out is a beautiful picture. A picture that only makes sense in retrospect, that you can see what God was doing with your life. Okay, so don't waste, waste that darkness. That's what I'm trying to say. Don't waste the darkness. But today I want us to take this thought a little further and we're looking at um, what we call dealings. Okay, uh, and the title is Dealings, the Making of God's Man. So I want to... I have an anchor scripture, but if I read anchor scripture right now, we I, I believe we may not get the full concept. So I want to take several steps backward to just establish some things foundationally, okay? And um, please follow me. I, I want to lay this one after the other, right? And we're going to look at scriptures. Of course, it is a Bible study, so we'll look at scriptures together. But I want us to build and grow into this concept just because... If it is misunderstood, again, any of the extremes can be, uh, will be dangerous, um, whether the left or the right extreme. And you see what I mean when we get there. Okay, so let's lay a foundation. First point I want to make as we lay this foundation is that God wants to profit from our lives. God wants to profit from us. God wants to be able to, to draw profit. I, I, I can't just avoid the word. God wants to be able to draw profit from your life. Basic terms um, of what profit means is if you make an investment in a business, okay, and then let's say you make an investment of $1,000, and after some time, the business returns $2,500 to you. Your profit is $1,500, okay? Simple math. So what I'm saying is that God wants to make profit from the deposit he has made in your life. 
the great things he has given to you, the magnificent destiny he has um, assigned to you. He wants to draw profit from your life. That means your very existence should be giving God returns on his, on his investments. If God has invested relationships in your life, if God has invested um, money in your life, if God has invested anointing, if God has invested skills, if God has invested abilities, whatever those things are, God wants to profit from your life. And this is a part of God that it's easy for many believers to miss if they interpret love, you know, one-sided. And, and what I mean is this, of course, God is love and God, God loves us not because of anything we've done. He loves us because that is who he is. There's nothing <clears throat> you're going to do that will stop God from loving you. Inherently, God is love. It's just the same way um, water is wet. You cannot separate the wetness from water. You cannot separate water from the wetness. In fact, they both derive their you know definitions from each other. So water is will always be wet. You cannot, there can never be dry water or anything like that. All right. It's the same way too, you can't separate God from love. God is, is love. That's what the scripture says. He will always be love. But here is it. Even though God doesn't love us because of what we do, yet he rewards us because of what we do. And this is where I'm going to that. If we if we just um if we just settle only for that expression of love that that we we have come to understand in the sense that. Um, God loves me regardless of what I do. That is fantastic and true. But God doesn't reward you regardless of what you do. He rewards you based on what you do. And God makes an investment in our lives from which he wants to derive profit. Okay, so let's look at a few scriptures to explain this. I, I may not be able to read all of them, but I'll just you know quote some for you. However, I want to read Hebrews chapter 6, verse 7 and 8. Uh, let's read Hebrews chapter 6, verse 7 and eight don't forget that god wants to draw profit from your life he wants to draw profit from your life if god has given you what think of anything god has given you he wants profit from it and um in in, in a sense god is a businessman if we may put it that way where he he doesn't just invest things and ignore them and just forget about them and we're going to look from script look at this from scripture so let's read um uh, hebrews chapter chapter 6 verse 7 and 8 Hebrews chapter 6 verse 7 and 8 look at what the bible says for the earth <clears throat> excuse me for the earth we drinks water we drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessings from god but if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. So the Bible is talking figuratively and says that the, the earth or the land which drinks rain, which is poured upon it continuously, if the, continuously, if that land bears fruits, which is useful for those by whom it is cultivated, then it, the land receives a blessing from God. And this is how our life should be. That God keeps on point his reign, his reign of wisdom, his reign of abundance, his reign of right relationships, his reign of favor, all of that. He pours it in our lives. And the hope is that we bear fruit that is useful to him who has cultivated us. Okay, and in fact, I want us to note the word useful because we're going to come back to it. Another word for useful there is profitable. So God is pouring, you know, his reign from heaven. And I mean, will I say coincidentally, it's currently raining as, as, as I'm speaking, but God is pouring out his rain upon you and he's pouring out his expressions from heaven upon you. And the Bible says that he wants to drop pleasure from it. He wants, to, he, he's looking for some fruits that you bear um, from it. Okay. And look at what it says in verse, um, in another translation, rather, the passion translation says, for men's hearts are just like the soil that drinks up the showers which often fall upon it. Some soil will yield crops as God's blessings upon the field. But if the field continues to produce only thorns and thistles, a curse hangs over it and it will be burned. So the, that soil or that land is likened to our hearts. Okay, now let's read another scripture to show 
the fact that God is interested in us bearing fruit. <clears throat> Excuse me. Luke chapter 13, verse 6 to 9. Luke chapter 13, verse 6 to 9. Luke chapter 13, verse uh, 6 to 9. While you're opening there, just give me a moment. I need to drink water and clear my throat. <clears throat> okay, Luke chapter 13, verse 6 to 9. I'm, I'm going to read, read this uh, a bit quickly now. He also spoke this parable. This is Jesus Christ. <clears throat> a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came seeking fruit on it and found none. So this man planted a fig tree in his vineyard and after some time, he came to look for fruits on the tree, but he didn't find any fruits. And I'm telling you that this is the way God is. Yes, you gave your life to Christ. Great. God has, you know, blessed you with so many things. Fantastic. But God is coming to watch and says, ah, this is my daughter. This is my son. I've given them this. I've given them that. Where's the fruits? Where's the returns of, on what I've given them? And again, let me say that. The fruits you bear is not the reason why God will love you. God loves you regardless. He's lo in fact, he loved you before you, you knew about him. So he loves you. So we settle that. But I'm saying that when with the things that he has blessed you with, God is looking for returns, <clears throat> for returns on his investment. He's looking for the his children that will be profitable to him. So he says that this man came and was looking for fruit on this tree and he found none. Verse 7. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this tree and found none. He says, cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? And I'm telling you that God is saying, ah, for, for, for six months, one year, two years, three years, five years, this person has been a believer. Where is the fruit from his life? Who, who has come to know Jesus Christ through this person? How has the kingdom of God expanded through the life of this, my, my, my son or my daughter. And I'm saying God is coming to check and to see if he's getting fruit from your life. If he's getting returns from your life, if you are profitable unto him. Verse eight, but he answered and said to him, sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well, but if not, after that, you can cut it down. So God is, I'm reading of this to just explain to us that God actually is looking for fruits in our lives. And this is something you should think about very well. You know, let me just share a, a, my, a testimony to God's glory. That every place I have worked, I have worked in, or in every company I've worked, worked with, I noticed that God always used me in one way or the other to minister to somebody, to help somebody um, get to know God better in that place. At least one person. There may be more, but at least one person. And I'm grateful to God, you know, for the opportunity. But I also believe that God must be pleased or God must be happy to say that, okay, it's not just salary that this, my son is getting from this job, but even me, I'm getting a return on my investment in him. The investment of giving him a, a job, I'm getting the returns of people getting to know me more. And in that way, God is God. God will not let me be without a job. You understand what I'm saying, right? So God wants us. God wants us to get returns. God wants to get returns rather from our lives. Okay, you can read um the story of the uh, the parable of the talents is in Matthew chapter twenty five. Uh, I'll start reading from verse fourteen to thirty, where Jesus Christ explains you know the parable of the talents. But what I just want to portray again is the fact that a time came when the master. Um, needed to reckon, and if you read verse verse nineteen, the Bible says that the master came back and he wanted to reckon with them. The word reckon used there in the King James version is is the word is a is an accounting word, right? It means to keep to check the books to but you know what we call a balance sheet. It's is the same ideology that it conveys. So God came really to do the balance sheet to check the bottom line. Oh, I gave you. Uh, X, Y, Z talents. What have you done with it? And even though this context was um, refers to money, 
But the principle is the same, right? Money is a store of value. And so what God is looking at is from the value I gave you, how much value have you brought back to the kingdom of God? So God wants to get returns from our lives. God wants to profit from our lives. All right. So I hope I've been able to establish that without any doubt that God wants to profit from our lives. That's the first point I want to make. Second point I want to make is that as much as God wants to profit from our lives, unfortunately, it is not every believer that is profitable to God. I wish it were every believer and God really wishes it was every believer. But unfortunately, it is not every believer that profits from, that is profitable rather to God. It is not every believer that is profitable to God. And um, what do you mean? Somebody will ask me, says, no, 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 but Victor, I don't agree. God loves us the way we are. I have said that right from the beginning. God loves us the way we are, but God doesn't profit from every believer. And God doesn't profit from every believer, every believer the same way. Let me tell you, there are some believers that the reason why they will not die now is not because, it's not just because, oh, God has a covenant of life with them. Mm -mm. Is that their presence on earth is so profitable to God that he, he's not ready for them to live yet. That's what Paul was saying. That What, what Paul was saying, he says, to to um to die is gain all right um, but he'd rather be in, in in the body or rather stay in in the flesh for the sake of the people all right that were there and that that means that his presence on earth was strengthening believers and god god would rather elongate his life or lengthen his life for that particular reason all right and so there are people whose and i i pray and this is my prayer for us that you are among those people whose existence on earth is of immense value to God. God knows that if we take this person away from the earth now, millions of lives will not be saved. Millions of lives will not know God. And so God says, no, 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 we can't, this person can't die now. And no matter what the devil does, he can't take them. All right. So not everybody is profitable in, to God, number one. And we're not all profitable, all profitable to God in the same measure. But my prayer is that we grow in our profitability to God. See, let me tell you something. This is moving into mature conversations in, in, in the faith, all right? Because you can't always, you can't just remain on the give me, give me, give me, give me side of things where all you are, all you are concerned about is your well-being and your, your finances and just your family and you're okay. God has to be, God has to be able to say, you are the reason why 10 people will be standing. You are the reason why food is on someone else's table. You are the reason why this person has come to know me. There must be that conversation in your life and that's that returns on investment from your life. So not everybody is profitable to God, unfortunately. And look at what the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 20 and 21. All right. <clears throat> 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20 and 21. All right. The Bible says that, but in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. So the Bible here is using the illustration of a house and vessels okay and we are that we are those vessels and god's kingdom represents that house then he says in verse 21 therefore if anyone cleanses himself from the letter he will be a vessel of honor sanctified and useful for the master prepared for every good work i want to draw our attention to this phrase it says sanctified and useful for the master the word useful, right, in the Greek there is the same word profitable. So it says sanctified and profitable for the master's use, meaning that it is not everybody that's sanctified because it says, therefore, if anyone cleanses himself, so it's a condition. If anyone cleanses himself from the latter, then he will become a vessel of honor. So in a master's great house, right, there are vessels of, of honor and vessels of dishonor or noble and ignoble vessels, even though they are still in the master's house. Um, there is there are vessels of gold, of silver, but then there are also vessels of wood and of clay. 
then the Bible now says that it's possible for you to sanctify yourself and become profitable to the master's use. So the first thing I want to establish from this scripture is that <clears throat> not everybody is profitable for the master's use. Unfortunately, but that is true. Not everyone is profitable. Um, it, it, not everyone is profitable to God. And, and this may sound very, very strong and harsh, but this is really the truth from God's word that not every believer brings profit to God's life. There are believers that have the investment of God's gift upon them. They have prophetic investment. They have investments of wisdom. They have investments of, um, um, of you know, vocal powers and, and um, oratory skills, but they are not using it for God's kingdom or they are hiding it or they are just maybe even ignorant of it. And not, and not every believer is profitable to God. So the question you may be asking now, which is what I also asked is, how can a believer be profitable to God? How? How? Because that is my goal. I want to be, I want to appear before Jesus Christ and he says, well done, good and faithful servants. But how can I be profitable to God? How, what, what, what measures do I need to put in place to get to that point? Okay. And so that takes us to the next thing I want to point from this verse. So if we go back to verse 21, okay, let me read verse 21 again. It says, therefore, this is 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21. Therefore, if anyone <clears throat> cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful for the master's use. He will be a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful for the master's use. So the way you become useful or profitable for the master is when you are sanctified. So sanctification is the door that opens into profitability before God. And why is this so? Like what is really the big deal about being sanctified? It's a, it's a simple thing. God doesn't use anything that is not sanctified. God doesn't use anyone that is not sanctified. And then I'm going to explain to us, you know, in, in this context for this study, what the what sanctification means, all right? But I need to read a scripture to us. Um, turn to the book of Numbers, <clears throat> excuse me, Numbers chapter 7, verse 1, sanctification, okay? Numbers chapter 7, uh, we'll just read verse 1 to buttress this. Okay, look at what the Bible says. And it came to pass when Moses had finished setting up the tabernacle that he anointed it and consecrated it and all its furnishings and the altar and all its utens utensils. So he anointed them and consecrated them. Re First of all, the word here consecrated is, is the same word meaning sanctified. So Moses had, you know, done, finished setting up the tabernacle of God. And the, the vessels inside and the furnishings and everything, Moses did two things. He anointed them and he sanctified them. Remember in 2 Timothy where we're coming from, Bible talks about us being vessels in the house of God. Okay, so it's the same way in, in, in Numbers 7 verse 1 here. Those vessels is synonymous to we as believers or we Christians in the house of God where his vessels all right, and when it comes to to with respect to us being used by God, the Bible refers to us as vessels. Okay, two 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 things to with respect to us um, housing God and with respect to us being used by God. The Bible refers to us as vessels. So in Moses' tabernacle, two things he did with the vessels: he anointed them and he sanctified them. Now the problem with believers is that they want to be anointed only, but they don't want to be sanctified. But that, it doesn't work that way. In the house of God, you are both anointed, meaning you are endued with supernatural ability to do the work that God wants you to do. And secondly, you are sanctified. Sanctified means you are set apart. You are separated. And this is where I'm going to. Or, or before I emphasize on that, I just want to touch a little further on this, that believers, you know, generally would love being anointed. I want to be anointed. I want to speak and then people just fall under the power of God. I want to prophesy to the nations, and that is a very awesome desire. 
But anointing doesn't come alone. Anointing always comes with sanct sanctification. And if you see someone who is anointed but not sanctified, then the person is a candidate to be used by the devil. Because the only reason why God will use you is not because you are anointed. God is the one that will anoint you. The reason why he would use you is because you are sanctified. God doesn't use people because they are anointed. God uses people because they are sanctified. So even if an if an quote and unquote unanointed person is available and sanctified for God, God will anoint that person. But if a, an anointed person is not sanctified, he would be a vessel in God's hand. So God uses people that are sanctified. So if you see someone who is anointed but not sanctified, then the person is a candidate to be used by the devil. And, and there are so many people like that. I mean, unfortunately, even pastors, people that carry the anointing that God gave them, okay, because the anointing of God... Um, and the gifts of God are without repentance or without calling back. They you have those gifts, but they are not sanctified and they are available to be used by the devil. All right. So God only uses people that are sanctified. Now, what does sanctification mean? Fundamentally, it means separation. And there's a whole um, there's a whole doctrine of sanctification, which is not what we are going into today. But I just want to fundamentally establish that sanctification means separation. Okay. Primarily, it means separation onto a person or onto a particular thing. So when God says he wants us to be sanctified, he wants us to be separated onto him. All right. But what do I mean by separation in this context? I, I want to, because I'm going somewhere. And remember I said, this is just foundation. I've not, I've not read our real anchor text, but I need to go through all of this and lay foundation for it to make sense to us. So what does what what do I mean by sanctification? I've said that it is that separation, really, where you are separated unto God for God's use. And I want to read a scripture that really depicts the idea of sanctification to us. All right. Um, look at the gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 19, verse 28 to 31. Luke chapter 19, uh, verse. 28 to 31. I hope you're following. I mean, if you're following so far, just drop a comment in the section and uh, let me in, you know, in the comment section or in the chat, let me know that you are following me uh, so far. All right. Let me know that you are with me. Okay. So I said Luke chapter 19, verse uh, 28 to 31. Okay, don't forget, drop your comments. Let me know that you are with me. All right, Luke chapter 8, 19, yeah, verse 28 says, when he had said these, this is talking about Jesus, he went ahead, ahead going up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village opposite you, where, where as you enter, you will find a cult, meaning a donkey, tied on which no one has ever sat so i want you to take note of that jesus was asking these people to go into a, a village and they're going to see a donkey that nobody has ever ridden nobody has ever sat on then he, he goes on to say lose it and bring it here verse 31 and if anyone asks you why are you losing it thus you shall say to them because the lord has need of it do you understand the picture here that he said to disciples, go into this village, you'll find a donkey that nobody has ever used before. And take that donkey, lose it and bring it with you. And if anybody asks you, why are you losing that donkey? Tell them that the Lord has use of it. Meaning the Lord can only use things that have not been used before. All right? And that is the idea of sanctification. Using things that are only exclusive to to God. That is what sanctification is. So God doesn't want to use donkeys that is commonplace, that is just a next, after someone has reading it, uh, you, you write it next, then pass it to his person. No, no, no. God wants to use donkeys that are exclusive to himself. And this represents how God wants to use us. Now, God wants to use us as we are exclusive to him. <clears throat> okay. You know, just Christ says, when they ask, tell them the Lord has need of it. I'm sure there were several other donkeys in that village. I'm sure there were several other donkeys, even in the place where Jesus was before going into that, um, sending disciples into the village. But Jesus didn't ask for any of those ones. And I believe he was trying to show us the kind of people that God used. 
right, are the people that are exclusive to him, that you're not being ridden by other people, they're not being used by other people. What this means is that nobody can come and lay claim to that donkey, you know, in this case, and say, oh, I, this is my donkey, this is the donkey I use. No. And it's the same way too in our own lives. God doesn't want, want anyone to be able to lay claim to us and say, um, oh, I, I use I use Victor too, but we are sharing Victor. You know, you use him today in the morning, use him in the evening. No, God doesn't want that. God doesn't want the devil to be able to come and say, ah, uh, you can use Victor now that he doesn't have money, but when he has money, it's my turn to use him. No, no, no. God wants exclusivity. That's what sanctification is. Where you are separated unto him alone. Okay, now I want to go back to the beginning and trace our steps up to this point to be sure we are together. Number one is that God wants to be, God wants to draw profit from our lives. He wants to derive um, value from our lives, from the investments he has made, in, made into us. He wants to return on his investments, okay? He wants a life that is profitable. And we said, secondly, that not everybody is profitable to God, unfortunately. Um, and the reason is because for you to be profitable to God, you have to be sanctified, okay? And sanctification means separation unto God, separation unto God alone, that exclusivity, that's what God is looking for. And that's, that's exactly what God wants from our lives. Um, and here we are in this verse, proving that God only uses things that are sanctified to him. Okay. Now, the question you now ask is, because even though, like in this story, the donkey had never been used by anyone, but for most of us, we've, we have our past, we have history that didn't quite include God. You know what I mean? So what does God do to get us to the state that it's, we are exclusive for him alone? All right? Now, this is where we, we, we get the title of today's uh, Bible study from. That God, for God to get us to that state where we are now exclusive for his use alone, he takes us through what we call dealings. All right? He takes us through what we call dealings. Now, what... Are dealings, and this is my my own definition, you know, by the way. Dealings are experiences or encounters that God allows us to have in order to strip us of anything that re reduces our profitability in his hands. Let me take that again. Dealings are encounters or experiences that God allows us to have that strips us of anything that reduces our profitability in his hands. So when God allows you to have encounters or God allows you to go through experiences that will, will strip away from you anything that would reduce your profitability in God's hands, those are dealings, all right? So God allows us to go through dealings that will make us better use, make us of better use in his hands, all right? That, those are, that's what we refer to as dealings. And I said here that dealings can be encounters or experiences. Maybe God encounter, you know, you have an encounter of God in a, in a particular way or in a particular area of your life, or you go through some experiences that, you know, cuts it off from you things that reduces your profitability in God's hands. Those are what we refer to as dealings. Now we can read our anchor scripture. And our anchor scripture is Psalm 66, verse 8 to 12. Okay, so so look at this, look at this. Just before I read that, the donkey that um, Jesus sent disciples to get, the donkey was tied. The donkey was tied to a to tied to something, meaning it could not have been used if it was tied. So God had to cut off. You know, He instructed the disciples to lose the donkey, and that's what God does. He has to remove us or detach us from whatever will hinder us from being profitable in His hands. And that's the process of dealings, okay? Where God allows you to go through experiences that makes you a better fit or, or a better use in God's hands. And the reason why this has to be so is because when God begins to um, ex expand the expression of his grace upon your life, if there are things that has not been dealt with, then those things will become a tool that the enemy will end up using, right, to... Uh, to, to fight what God is doing in your life and through your life. So what God does is that he takes us through dealings. And a good example is Joseph that we looked at last week. We saw how that Joseph was 
I mean, for as a child, he was naive. He was he had this air of pride around him because he was the loved of his father. He was the favorite, you know, the favorite child of his father. And um, he was just even quite boastful, to be honest, uh, telling the, his brothers, oh, the dream I had, you're going to bow down to me. You are going to, um, you know, the sun and the moon and all of those kind of things. And God knew that if, if they leave jo Joseph the way he is, then it's going to be a big issue, right? Because Joseph would he would ascend the throne with this air of, of entitlement and pride. And so God had to allow Joseph to go through some experiences. And at the end of the day, we see Joseph as a prime minister. He could not even boast about his position anymore because God had dealt with pride or God had dealt with Joseph and cut off pride from his life. So I'm saying that this is what dealings uh, represent. The experiences that God will take us through or allow us to go through or so encounters that we have with him that will cut off areas that reduce our profitability in his hands all right so give me a minute there's some quite some noise coming from outside let me just uh take care of that All right. Okay, gotcha. So this should be better, yeah. So these are the, those kind of experiences that God will take us through to make sure that we are more profitable in his hands. Remember we said last week that the branch that bears fruit, the father prunes so that it can be more fruitful. So that pruning is the dealing process, all right, that God allows us to go through so that we are more fruitful in God's hands. Okay, so let's read our scripture. Um, Psalm 66, verse 8, 8 to 12. Psalm 66, verse 8 to verse 12. Now, we are reading the scripture in light of the things I've explained so that it makes sense because uh, you see what I mean when, I, when we read this. It, it, can, it can almost seem as though we are painting God in a dictatorship light, okay? But I want us to just read this together. Psalm 66, Verse 8 says, Oh, bless our God, you peoples, and make the voice of his praise to be heard. Who keeps our soul among the living and does not allow our feet to be moved? Now, by the way, the psalmist is writing this psalm in retrospect, meaning some things had happened in his life or some things that had gone on in his experiences. And he had come through those things. And looking back, he was now writing from a point of understanding. Meaning that when he was going through those things, he probably did not even understand what was going on. He didn't understand what God was doing. But after the whole experience happened, he looked back and he was not writing this psalm with, in hindsight, with the understanding of the experiences that he had just gone through. So look at what he said, um, continuing now in verse 10. For you, O God, have tested us. And I'm sure that when he was going through the test, he probably did not know that it was a test because he didn't feel comfortable. It's just the same way when God asked um, um, Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, Abraham himself did not know it was a test. It's because we are reading the scripture in hindsight that we know that God was testing Abraham. But in that moment, Abraham did not know it was a test from God. He actually was going to kill Isaac. And later God had to stop him and says, now I know that you love me. So when we go through the experiences, we don't really know that it's a test yet. It's in retrospect that we understand that, oh, this was actually a test. So let's look at this, verse, verse 10. For you, O oh God, have tested us. You have refined us as silver is refined. And this is so powerful that the psalmist was able to look back at whatever he went through and said that you were you refined me the way silver is refined. And question now is, how is silver refined? Simple, silver is refined by fire. So the psalmist must have gone through an experience of fire and he looked back and said, ah, that experience I was going through was actually refining me. It wasn't killing me, it was refining me. So it says, you have refined me as silver is refined. Verse 11, you brought us into the net. It's, it's almost like saying, you, you trapped me. You know, let me tell you something. If God wants to help you, God will put you in a situation that he's the only person you can depend on. 
And sometimes God will intentionally take away your support structures and support systems so that you will, quote unquote, fall into his own trap where you don't have anybody to call on to but God. And God is going to let you go get such situations because he wants to refine you. It's like when David ran away, the king, the king that, that you know, favored him and sent him, asked for him to come into the um, palace. Now he's the same king that wants to kill him. He had to run for his life. Nobody to help him. And that's where he called on the name of God. And he found God. And I'm telling you that sometimes God puts us in a, in a, in a quote unquote, in a trap. And the trap is such that you don't have any other help aside God. And for some people, unfortunately, is that they lose their parents or they lose a significant person in their lives or they lose their jobs that they've really been banking on. They've planned their career. They've planned their financials for the next 10 years based on this well-paying job. And then they lose the job. Or for some people is that... I mean, painfully so, this is really painful, but some people is that they've enfisted their, their lives with this, with this lady. They have planned their marriage and planned their family with this lady. The lady comes and says, oh, she's no more doing it again. And you, are, you don't just understand. And you not come to a point where nothing makes sense aside praying to God. That is the kind of net that God puts us into sometimes. And I'm telling you that the experiences are not very pleasant. And I say this with all sense of um, seriousness and, and empathy. But it is in those experiences that you are re we are refined. That's what the Bible is saying. So let's continue. Um, verse 11 says, you brought us into the net. You laid afflictions on our back. And the experiences we go through that, it just it feels like an affliction. Now, verse 12, look at it. It says, you have caused men to ride over our heads. So even in those experiences, you try to explain, let's say you are the, the guy now that the lady leaves you. You try to explain it and then people look at you and say, it's a lie. You don't know how to take care of a woman. That's why you are, you don't, you don't, you don't, you are, you know, they accuse you and say it's your fault that she left. Okay. Or maybe you, you do a business and the business crumbled and it crumbled because people you trusted betray you. That is men riding over your head, such betrayer. Or, or, or such, you know, backstabbing is men uh, riding over your head. Or you've gone through the, pro um, the whole process, let's say you finish school, and then a, one of your, your uncles, your close uncles, in fact, he was there when they gave birth to you, he has been there long, he says, don't worry, after NYC, I'll give you a job in XYZ company, and you've already banked on it. And then he now disappoints and says, well, you know, you know, things just happen, this is outside my control, I'm sorry, but just take this 20,000, you know, for the weekend, and then your, your, your life just, or all your hopes just crumble. Disappointments. That is God allowing men ride over you. And there's a reason, and we're going to look at it now. But when those experiences happen, I, I don't want you to, to think about it as though that is the end. No. Remember, the psalmist says, you refined us like silver. So look at it. Verse 12. You have caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and water. I mean, this guy must have gone through a lot, must have gone through difficult um, seasons, must have gone through overwhelming seasons because the fire represents that pressure, that heat. The water represents overwhelm, where the water wants to swallow you and just take you along. Might have gone through things that are overwhelming. Maybe several things are going on at the same time. I just feel like it is. this is too much. It's just too much for one person to, to handle. You feel overwhelmed by it. The, the psalm is saying that he, they went through fire and they went through water. But look, at, I'm so happy that's not the end of the story. Look at it. He says, let me start from verse 12, beginning again. You have caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, but you brought us to a to rich fulfillment. Other translation says you brought us to a spacious place. Other, another translation, King James says you brought us to a wealthy place. So even though God, they went through all of this, yet God brought them into a place of rich fulfillment, into a spacious place. And I'm telling you that all the fire, all the water, all the overwhelm was not the end of the story. God is bringing you into a place of rich fulfillment, but he has to refine you. He has to take away the impurities from you. And the reason why the why the, why silver is passed through fire is so that it can be refined. And refining here means removing the impurities that are in that um, in that precious metal. So when God allows us to go through fire and storm and all of that, it's because he wants to remove the impurities that are 
are going that are embedded in us. He wants to take away those impurities. All right. And yes, you may say, oh no, no, I'm a I'm a I'm a good man, I'm a good woman. I don't, I don't, I'm okay. My character is perfect, it's 10 over 10. No problem. There is only one way to find out, and it is when you go through fire and when you go through tests, okay. And this is the way God deals with his men to deals with people to make them profitable in his in his hands. Don't forget the sequence. The sequence first is that God wants us to God wants to to draw profit from our lives. Number two is that not everybody is profitable to God. You're only profitable to God when you're consecrated or when you're sanctified. And that process of sanctification uh, or the way God sanctifies us is by letting us go through fire and water, by separating us, okay? Um, removing impurity from us. That's the same, that's the only way God, you know, sanctifies us. Okay. So I want to, as we begin to round up now, I want to just look at very, very quickly, look at some examples from, the word of God about people that God God dealt with, the dealings of God, all right? How God worked in people's lives to remove those impurities. And one of the major impurities that God removes from everyone's life is the dependence on self. When you are depending on yourself, or depending on your ability, or depending on any other thing aside God, God wants to, you see, God is a jealous God. He wants to be your only source. He wants to be your only um, pillar. He wants to be the only person that you can depend on. And that is what God works on in everybody's life. That, that um, uh, sense of self-dependence, God removes it away and makes it God-dependent. Okay? So two scriptures as we, two, two examples, sorry, as we wrap up now. Two examples of, of people that God worked with, that God dealt with, all right? And you understand the use of the word dealt with, no, not in the negative sense now, but I mean, God, you know, took them through dealings and got them to a point where they could trust in him alone. Okay, so let's look at these two examples. We're going to look at Abraham. Hmm. Okay, we'll look at three, but I, I'll try and run through them quickly because I want us to look at Abraham, Moses, and Peter, but I'll run, them, um, run through them quickly. Um, look at Abraham. Abraham... I was going to say Abraham chapter 22. Genesis, rather, Genesis chapter 19, not Abraham. Genesis chapter 19. Um, now, these are long reads, but I will give, I'll just give a summary. But here you can find the story in Genesis chapter 19, verse, verse, sorry, Genesis chapter 12, I beg your pardon, verse 9 to 20. Genesis chapter 12, verse 9 to verse 20. All right. So God had called Abraham and said, leave your father's house to a place I'm going to show you and all of that. And Abraham departed. But look at what happened. Now there was famine in the land of Egypt. Okay. And there, there was famine rather, not, not in the land of Egypt. There was famine in, in the land where he was. But Abraham went to the land of Egypt. Now I've read this story several times and none of the times I've read it did I see that God told Abraham to go to Egypt or that Abraham inquired of God and said, God, should I go? And then God said, yes, no, none of those times. Meaning that Abraham, I, I believe must have looked at the, you know, economic benefits. There's farming in this land. Uh, our cattle are not, are not getting grass to feed. We cannot farm. Let's look for a land where there is no farming. And he looked at, he did his analysis and saw that Egypt was a good land and he went there. All right. But God did not ask him to go there. He didn't send him to go. And one of the ways you know that God didn't send him to go was that Abraham had to come up with his own, um, with his own tactics of surviving in Egypt. But if God had sent him, he God would have pro prepared um, his own way of surviving in 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 um, in that land of Egypt. Okay. But God didn't send Abraham. Abraham just went because it was a good decision. But not every good decision is a godly decision or is a decision that comes from God. All right. So yeah, Abraham went on by himself. And what was Abraham's tactics? Abraham knew that Sarah was a beautiful woman, even though she was in her old age. I mean, I'm just trying to imagine how Sarah must have been so beautiful, even at that age. But he, he knew Abraham, was, um, he knew Sarah was very beautiful. And he said to Sarah that if you love me, this let's follow my plan. When you enter the land of Egypt, tell them you are my sister, okay? 
Um, and in, in a sense, uh, you, that was, wasn't an entire lie. Tell them you are my sister, because if you tell them you are my wife, they would want you and they will kill me so that they can have you. So tell them you are my sister and they will just, and let me tell you, Abraham knew what he was doing. What he was saying in essence was, tell them you are my sister so that if they take you, at least they will spare my life, all right? And that plan worked at least up to a point. When they entered there, in fact, the, the Sarah was so beautiful that it was the servants in Pharaoh's um, palace that recommended Sarah to Pharaoh and says, Madam, we, we don't see this hot woman. This woman, fine, die. You, you must, she must marry her. And so they brought Sarah to the, to the palace. But again, like we know the story, God appeared to Pharaoh and said to her that you are a dead, a dead man. You don't know. In fact, you know, God, God began to plague the house of Pharaoh because of, of Sarah. And then uh, we know the rest of the story. But eventually, Abraham, they, they sent Abraham and Sarah away from, from Egypt. And guess what? They went back to the exact same place they were before they left to, for Egypt. And then they called upon the name of the Lord. Now, this is just a summary, but I want to read a verse here because I want to highlight something. So chapter 12 of Genesis verse... Um, verse 15, the princes also of Pharaoh, of, of Pharaoh, sorry, the princes of also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. Look at verse 16. And he entreated Abraham well for her sake, meaning he treated Abraham very well for her sake. And he had sheep and oxen and his asses and men servants and men servants and she asses and cam camels. I mean, because of, of, of Sarah, Pharaoh gave Abraham, you know, a lot of things, donkeys, cattle, camels, essentially gave Abraham money if it were in today's, today's day. Now look at verse, um, verse chapter 13, verse 2. So remember that Pharaoh gave Abraham a lot of stuff. Chapter 13, verse 2, and Abraham was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. So in chapter 2, chapter 13, verse 2, the Bible says Abraham was rich in cattle, silver, and gold. But where did some of this wealth come from? It came from his, uh, his adventure in Egypt, right? And it was Pharaoh that gave him stuff. But Pharaoh gave him stuff because Abraham deceived, you know, Pharaoh in that sense, all right? He, he lied and said, oh, this is my sister and all of that. So part of this wealth was, was part of the wealth was from the free gift that Pharaoh had given unto him. Okay, now I'm going somewhere. Now, if you continue in chapter 13, you see that at some point, um, Lot and Abraham, Abraham's um, servants started having friction and then um, they parted ways. And right after Lot left Abraham, the Lord appeared to Abraham again. Now look at verse 14 of chapter 13. So Genesis chapter 13, verse 14. And the Lord said unto Abraham, after Lot was separated from him, he says, lift up your eyes for, and look from where you, from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land that you see, to thee I will give to you and to your seed forever. So Abraham had an encounter with God right after Lot left. And he said, all this land you can, you can see, north, south, east, west, I have given unto you forever. Now, this encounter changed something in the mind of, of Abraham because before then, Abraham was, was open to even collecting gifts from Pharaoh dubiously, even though he, he lied about it. And that was part of where his riches had come from. But now God came to Abraham and said, you know what, all this land all around you, I have given it to you. That encounter changed something in Abraham's life. How do I know? I know from the next chapter. But remember our definition of dealings. A dealing is an experience or an encounter that God allows us to have that reads us or strips us of anything that reduces our profitability in his hands. So Abraham, God wanted Abraham to be more profitable to God, but God wanted Abraham to be dependent on him alone. And so from this encounter, God spoke to him and said, I've given all this land to you. And something changed in Abraham. How do I know? I know this because in the next chapter, um, you know, Lot got into prop into Lot moved to the land of Solomon and Gomorrah. There was there was war. Abraham mobilized his soldiers and some of his friends, and they went to rescue Lot. Now, on the way back, and not just rescue Lot, rescue the whole, you know, um, the the king of Sodom and everyone that everyone that was captured. Now, on their way back, the king of Sodom, out of gratitude, now. 
Abraham was was the one who who went with with his soldiers and some of his friends and their and their own men, and they went to deliver the king of Sodom. It is very it is expected that this king should show gratitude and even give you things, which is exactly what the king of Sodom did. But Abraham refused the gifts. And that is how I know that Abraham had changed from the last encounter he had with God. Because when Pharaoh gave Abraham gifts, Abraham did not reject it. He collected it, even though he, he, he you know, was, he was sneaky with his approach. But he collected it. But now that he, he, he rightfully earned those rewards, he's rejecting it. And look at what Abraham said in Genesis chapter 14. Let's start reading from verse 21. And the king of Sodom said unto Abraham, Give me the person and take the goods for thyself. And Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you say, I have made Abraham rich. So Abraham said, I have, I have raised my hand. And when he says I raised my hand, it's, it's, it's a gesture of swearing before God. I raised my hand before God that I will not collect anything from you so that you will not say you made Abraham rich. Just imagine the thinking. Just, but so, some, some two chapters ago, Abraham was collecting things from Pharaoh. And then even the next chapter tells us that Abraham was rich in cattle and all of that. And part of it was what he received from Pharaoh. But now... Even though he were, he had right to receive this thing from so, um, the king of Sodom, he said, I'm not collecting anything from you so that you will not say Abra you made Abraham rich. Why did he have that change in mindset? It was because of the encounter he had with God. Where God says, I would look all around uh, this land, I've given it to you. So based on that encounter, he knew that God wanted to be the sole source of his riches. And that made a change in his heart. And so when the king of Sodom says, take, take anything that, that you want from, from, the, from the spoil of this, of this victory, Abraham said, no, 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 I will not take anything so that you will not be able to say you made Abraham rich. So Abraham had come to understand that God wanted to be his exclusive source, okay? God wanted to be the only person that can lay claim to his donkey. Remember our, our, our story from, um, from the book of Luke. God wanted to be the only one that would ride Abraham's you know, life in terms of riches, okay? And so Abraham said, I will not collect anything from you. At that point, Abraham had experienced the dealings of God. So he had he was sanctified to God. And he knew that his finances will come only from God, not from, from any, the assistance of any, anybody that will, that will try to lay claim to such, um, to such riches. I hope you get the picture. That on one hand, Abraham was sneaky, going to Egypt, collecting gifts from, from Pharaoh, even though God didn't necessarily lead him there. And then he encountered God and God says, I would, all the land around you have given to you as a possession. And then now the king of Sodom says, take, take riches. And Abraham says, no, 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 no. In other words, saying, I, I know what God has spoken to me. I don't want to collect money from you so that you will not think that when I'm rich in the future, you are the one that made me rich. Abraham knew something. And I'm telling you that God wants to bring us to that place of exclusivity where we are dependent on God and God alone. All right. Okay, so two more examples. I'll just, I, I wouldn't read the verses, but I would tell you where they can be found because I want us to wrap up right now. Second example is the story of Moses. All right, if you read Acts chapter 7, verse 22, read from verse 22 down to 35. Um, Stephen was recounting this story and was sharing the experiences um, of, of Moses and, and the patriarchs. But he, he, gave, he gave us a summary and that's why I want us to read it I would love us to read it from there. So at your time, please read Acts chapter 7, verse 22 to 35. But the Bible says that um, Moses was skilled in, was well, you know, rounded in knowledge, in, in wisdom, in the ex experiences. I know I said I was not going to read, but I want to read that particular verse, please. Pardon me. Acts chapter 7, verse verse 22. And Moses was learned in all wisdom, of the Egyptians and was mighty in deeds and in, and in words. This is a an excellent resume. He was he was skilled. He knew the the the, on the, the learning of the Egyptians. He was mighty deeds and in words, meaning that he's he was a good you know if he if he could he could talk and convince people. Um, in mighty in deeds. His actions you know went ahead of him and all of that. And you know when people who are gifted don't intentionally submit to God. 
their giftings and their skills may be the very thing that hinders them from being used by God. Because Moses knew he was, he was mighty in words and deeds. And when it entered into his heart to deliver the Israelites, he thought that it was his, his mighty deeds and his resume that God was going to use. And so he went out and killed an Egyptian and that cost him 40 more years until the time God appeared to him again in the wilderness with the, in, the fire, in the bush that was burning but wasn't consumed. And then God said, remove your sandals for where you stand is the holy ground. That, that um, re removal of sandals is symbolic to surrender. So God was saying, you've tried to, to you know, go on, on an assignment with your own strength, but now I'm calling you, but first you have to surrender. And God always come, brings us to that point of surrender, all right, where we are only trusting in him. That's where God wants us to, be, to, to get to. And so these dealings are to bring us to a place of absolute trust and surrender before him, okay? Last example is um, Peter. Um, Peter was with Jesus. Jesus said, ah, you people would, would you know, betray me and leave me. And Peter with, was the loudest. He said, no, 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 no. Even if every other person leaves, I cannot leave you. I will not be, betray you. In fact, even if I have to die, I will, not, I will not deny you. Well, we know the story. Peter denied Jesus Christ three times, just as Jesus Christ has said. And the reason is because Peter was making that, you know, boast on his own flesh and, and his ability. Based on his zeal, he says, I will never deny you. But the things of destiny are deeper than your will. All right, the things of destiny require grace, and grace is received by those that are humble because he gives grace to the humble, and hum um, humility here rather represents submission. You've come to God to say, I can't do this by myself, I am submitted to you. So God will take us through dealings to get us to that point. That is the essence of today's um, study, that God will take us through dealings to bring us to a point where we are fully submitted to him and we know we cannot do anything without him okay i hope this study was clear enough i i i, I worry that it might have been too um will i say technical now but i hope it was clear clear enough uh to every one of us all right um so yeah the summary is that god wants us to be profitable to him but we can't be profitable if we're not sanctified and we can't be sanctified if he, if god doesn't take us through dealings dealings that make us exclusive to his use Okay, so let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you. We are grateful, Lord, for your word. We ask that you expand this truth in our hearts, establish it in our consciousness, help us to see things um, the way you see things in the name of Jesus Christ. And we ask that you help us to be fully dependent uh, on you and fully trust you. Thank you, Lord, for in Jesus' mighty name we've prayed. Amen. All right, thank you all for joining in uh, today's Bible study. I'm going to hand over to our host uh, to continue the rest of the study. All right, God bless you all. See you next week. We will continue these thoughts, all right, next week. Um, and um, yeah, just to establish this, because I think, I mean, time didn't let me go into, you know, details of what I'd like us to understand this concept properly. So we'll continue this next week and we will see you same time, same um same platforms whether it's zoom or mixella god bless you bye